just in time. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Beginnings in uh, Crazy Bright Wampsville. Um, let me just go over a couple of quick announcements that we have. Um, first of all, we had our Starry Starry Night last night. It was fabulous. We didn't get to see the stars because it was cloudy, but it was still a really great time of fellowship. We did talk about how amazing and huge God is, but yet he still knows every hair on our head, right? Um, and so that was great. We just want to keep encouraging you guys to hit up those Saturday night services. In a couple of weeks, um, in February, we're going to be doing one called Love Thy Neighbor. Um, I was informed that my neighbor son does not count. I can't just bring him as my neighbor. Like, that's unfair. Then I asked Marcus if he would be my neighbor, and I thought he said yes, right? Like, there's a little song saying, won't you be my neighbor? And he's like, sure. And then they're like, nope, that doesn't count. You have to invite your neighbor to come to our potluck and bring a potluck, to, a dish to pass. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm going to kind of put a challenge out there. Like, whoever gets the most neighbors maybe wins something. I don't know. What do you guys think? Right? So there's a, <laughs> there's a handout. And you guys take those home and invite your neighbors to come to this. So it's on February 11th. I think it says 6, but is it at 6 or 5? It's for real at 6. So you're going to invite your neighbor and also bring a side dish to share. So I think it'll be a great fun, and uh, I think you should come out just to see who uh, brings the most neighbors, right? Um, and then another announcement. Let me get back into January. We have our baptism coming up still. That's January 22nd. It's at the YMCA. We promise there's no polar plunge. However, the pool does get a little bit chilly sometimes at this time of year. And then um, on the 29th is going to be our annual meeting. So those were my announcements for today. And I know, I don't know where Lisa is, but Lisa's got, there she is, something to say. And I know it's going to be fabulous. <laughs> no. Hello? All right, I'm just going to talk. You guys can hear me anyway. Oh, now I hear it. I okay. hear it. <laughs> okay. You know I love getting up here, so... Uh, I'll make this really short. I wanted to uh, say what an amazing church we have, and all of you are a huge part of why this church is so successful. Um, we did some new things this past year. We um, did back-to-school bags, which I wanted to let you all know, in case you didn't know, that we gave North Broad School 80 bags with a rough estimate of $2,000 in those bags. So thank you all so much for that, because what a great way to be a part of this community mm -hmm. in, a, in a small way. And then we went into the homeless bags. Another great thing, Gina delivered all those bags. We had over 30 bags plus uh, extra scarves, hats, mittens, you name it, in those bags. So and you all have done a great job and that's why our church is so successful. Uh, and I wanted to thank you all for being a part of my life and everyone else's life in here. See, it doesn't take much to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> our, our next event. How about Lisa crying? <laughs> yeah, doesn't take, it doesn't take much. Our next event is Love Thy Neighbor. We still want to go out into the community and be a part of that so they can experience what we experience here every week or every other time that we're in here. Um, so we want to invite people. It doesn't have to actually be your neighbor, someone you know. I have invitations uh, I'll try to pass out before you all leave to bring someone to a potluck dinner. Those people don't have to bring food, but everybody that's going to come, I would uh, really appreciate if you could bring your dish that you love the most, whether it's brownies, donuts, <laughs> donuts. Uh, um, well, if you can't make a difference between brownies and donuts. Bring them both. Well, okay, I like that. Okay, good. good. So thank you all so much, and we're going to have an amazing year with events. The Saturday program is, is taking off, and if you just want to come and talk about the Bible and enjoy great people from this church, then there's no reason why you can't come for an hour or two. So thank you so much. <laughs> Father, I just want to thank you for the blessing of, of Lisa and bringing her into our church and our lives. And we just continue to grow our church for you, Jesus. We just want to make sure that we're serving in the ways that you want us to serve. So just keep laying on our hearts the things 
that you need us to do, whether it's the school kids or the homeless or just reaching out to our neighbors. Lord, we just thank you for putting those things on our heart. Mm. We ask that you come into our church today and open our hearts and our minds to our worship and just continue reminding us how great you are, but how much you still love us. And for that, just we're so grateful, Lord, and we thank you and we just ask you to bless this service and, and, um, and, and just take everything that we have and make it be part of you. Amen.
This is the case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. 
but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 10. I just want to piggyback on, on uh, um, what Lisa said regarding last night and um, how cool it was as far as that, that event, Starry, Starry Night. We didn't see any, any stars using the telescope, but we saw some stars on the, uh, on the, uh, the screen that we were, we were seeing. And I think those are from uh, the Webb, uh, James Webb Telescope. And it seems to me that uh, between Hubble and, and James Webb Telescope, um, that, that's been a kind of a, a game changer when it comes to viewing stars and just our ability to understand how vast the universe is. I mean, before that time, it seemed like there was maybe um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of stars. What was it, a billion, trillion stars? Uh, there's a billion trillion stars. Get your mind around that. There's a lot of zeros in a billion trillion stars. And that's the size of, uh, we understand that God created every one of those stars. The enormity of the power to create a billion trillion stars that are con continually expanding, going away from one another when gravity is trying to pull it back towards one another, right? That's the power of God. But there's also this idea of the, the, the ability of God to organize all these things. And that, that has blown me away. That was the thing that I, I, when, I, when I think of astronomy, that is the thing that really kind of blows me away. That God created all of these, these, these celestial objects in, in perfect motion around one another. And, and how you have stars and galaxies colliding and everything like that. It's just amazing as far as the power, the immensity of that. But here's the, the amazing thing that's, that's so cool. The God who created all that knows each and every one of us and is absolutely positively sold out for your good. He not only knows us, but he loves us. And he, and he you know, so many times we, we think that God is this God that, that um, has created the universe and he's created our lives and so on and so forth, and then he's kind of gone away. You know, many times we, we miss God in the mix as far as our life is concerned. But he's right there, many times too close to us so that we really don't even notice him right there. That's the God. That's what makes God so amazing. He is immense, but he's so personal. That's the, that's the coolest thing. Try to wrap your mind around that. And if you don't come away from that, feeling really good as far as your prospects are concerned, you haven't gotten your mind around it, really. The power of the God who created the universe is the same power that raised the sun from the dead. It's the same power whenever you pray to that God. The same power is available. That's pretty cool. Please join me in prayer. Father, we just give you thanks. We praise you because you are so good. Everything that we see is looking up into the night sky shows your power. Help us to, to see your power in our life. Help us to, to taste the goodness of you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, <clears throat> actually going to get to the message now. <laughs> the message behind the message. Um, we're, we're actually getting into the second and last message in this Life Church series called uh, To Gather. It's a series about why we want to, why you should join a life group. Last week we talked about that life change really comes from relationship. Life change is wrapped up in relationship, and it's more relationship than just the casual relationship of a Sunday morning. Can any one of you say, that I know everybody in this room really closely? Can anybody say that? No. Life change takes place in relationship. Now, <clears throat> this morning, 
in our scripture reading, we, we heard about the, the, the value of relationship and companionship. Um, in Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 10, you have the story of this man that um, didn't have anybody close to him, no relationships, no family, no kids, no friends, nothing. And what this, this man did was he tried to substitute accomplishment for a relationship. He tried to substitute accomplishment for a relationship. And I would submit to you that this is not alone as far as in the Bible. Actually, I, I would submit to you that you can, you can see a thread of this very thing moving through the Bible. It starts out with Genesis. Let me offer to you where it starts. Actually, in Genesis 1, the first chapter of Genesis, you have the accounting or the story of the creation of Adam, the first man. But then in Genesis 2, you have the same story of the creation of Adam, the first man. And most theologians have said, you know, this is two different sources of this accounting, and consequently, they were just smashed together. And this guy, Joseph Soloveitchik, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, in the 1960s, wrote this book, The Lonely Man of Faith. And in this book, he said, you know what? That's not it. It's not just smashing two creation stories together. It actually describes two aspects of humanity. Because in Genesis 1, you have Adam 1. Adam 1 is the one who is all about accomplishment. God creates Adam in order that he could be the one who actually manages the world from God. Adam 1 is the one who's up and to the right. Adam 1 is the one who's successful. But then you have the story of Adam 2 in Genesis 2. And Adam 2 was the one who was designed and created so he could tend the Garden of Eden. He was a landscaper, not the CEO. <laughs> bah, but he tended the Garden of Eden for a purpose. The purpose was he met God in the Garden. It's all about relationship. See, that was the first taste that we have. So here's this, this idea, this concept is that many times we get into accomplishment as a substitute for relationship. And what it does is it, 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 it sets up this cognitive dissidence. Cognitive dissidence is just believing something different than you do. Actions not following the beliefs. And there's a conflict between the two. And that's what not only this man that we see in, in Ecclesiastes have, because he comes to this place where he goes, why am I doing this? Why am I accumulating all this wealth for people I don't even know? Because I'm going to have to leave it to somebody that I don't know and I don't frankly care about. Why am I doing this? And we do the same thing many times. Because as Christians, we believe that relationships drive our experience not only here on earth, but also in heaven. One of the two big commandments, right? The two, the two great commandments, love the Lord your God, heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So our relationships drive our experience here on earth. But our relationship drives our experience in heaven. We either enjoy heaven or we endure hell based upon our relationship with God, right? So we have this idea, this understanding that relationships drive our experiences. But then we get into this place where we try to perform, we try to achieve in order to perhaps impress our neighbor as opposed to relate to our neighbor. And that sets up a resistance. I would submit to you that sets up a resistance and inertia. I love that word, inertia. It's just the resistance to get into relationship and to actually jump into a life group. I think there's a great inertia in the church today to the idea of change in our life through relationship. And I think it... Uh, 
this inertia, this resistance really takes the form of four mindsets. Let me offer to you those four mindsets. The first one is naivete. Naivete in the sense that there's people who just believe they don't need relationships. How many of you have uh, seen the program on Nat Geo, National Geographic Channel, uh, Life Be Below Zero? Has anybody seen that program, Life Below Zero? Life Below Zero, for those who haven't seen it, is a program that, that uh, tracks the life of a number of different families or individuals in Alaska. And perhaps the most um, <laughs> unlikely candidate for somebody to live in Alaska is the one who lives the furthest most, and that's this, this gal, Sue Aikens. Sue Aikens is this 50-something, this I think she's 59 years old at this point in time. She's living alone on the north slope of, the Alaska, of Alaska. It's way up there in the Arctic Circle. And she's living all alone. She lives alone even though she has a boyfriend and she's got kids from a previous marriage. She lives alone without any of them because she just doesn't think that she needs relationships. And many of us get to that same place. We just don't think, I don't need relationships. That's, that's too, much, too much work. So we get into this this naivete that we don't need relationships. The second mindset is the temperament. Half of us are introverts. The other half extroverts. The introverts have a tough time. Have a tough time trying to get into relationships. They're socially awkward, feel uncomfortable as far as trying to connect. I get it. The other thing would be fear. Fear could keep people from getting into life groups. Fear in two ways. For those people who have never been in a life group before, there could be fear based upon the idea, I have no idea what's going to happen in this thing. This might be the Spanish Inquisition where they want to play me and they want to show everything that might be shameful in my life. I don't want to share that stuff with these people. So it could be that. Or if you've had an experience with a life group or a small group before, it could be fear of a replication of a bad experience could be a very bad experience. I don't want to do that again. So it could be fear. But probably the most often used excuse, mindset, to resist the life group is just plain busyness. I'm too busy for another thing. And we talked about this last time. But I offer to you a question. What's keeping you busy? What are the things that keep you busy that makes it impossible for you to take on another thing? Because many times we, we are busy doing stuff that is not very profitable or beneficial for us. But we just do it because we've always done it. That's what we do. So we do it. What are those things? Taking an inventory and prioritizing those things that are really most important and most beneficial for us, I think you would find, generally speaking, a life group would be more beneficial than perhaps some of the things that you get into. And you have been doing. So these are four reasons, four mindsets that <coughs> keep people resistant to joining a life group. Let me offer to you four reasons why people should be part of a life group. And four, let me try to explain this. Each one of these are centered around a need that we all have, a relational need that we have. And the, these needs are attached to a, a particular aspect of relationship together. Um, let me just jump into the first one, try to explain that. The first aspect of our relational life is this aspect that we, we would, could, could call the arena. The arena is the place where we have a public persona we try to per, uh, portray ourselves as being in the arena. It's the place where I know what's going on and you know what's going on. It's things that we are comfortable in sharing. It's, it's, it's things like uh, that you would post on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any social media outlet. It's those things you feel very comfortable in sharing with other people. Information. 
My son-in-law loves to snap pictures of what he eats. Can I tell you, I don't care what he eats. It's been said that we live in a time where we're more connected than we've ever been in before. But we also live in a time when we're lonelier than we've ever been before. And this speaks to the idea of the need that's attached to this, this concept, this, this, this mindset, this aspect of relationship or, or the arena. Because you need a venue by which you can share stuff that is more personal than what you ate for dinner. We have lots of stuff going on in our life. Pains that we have. Praises that we can offer. Where do you share that? If you don't have anybody, if it's only Facebook, maybe you're, you're, you're a young woman who just lost a pregnancy. Where do you share that? I don't think you share it on Facebook. Where do you share that? Maybe you're an older gentleman with a large prostate or something along those lines, and you're going, could be cancerous. And you get the news that it's not, it's benign. Where do you share that? Where do you share the praises and the pains as far, as far as your life is concerned? Where do you share those things that are more personal than just what you eat? That's the first aspect of life, and that's the reason why you need to be part of a life group. Because there's a place, there's a venue that life give, groups give you that you can share something more personal than what you eat. The second one would be the mask. The life relational aspect of the mask. This is where I cover up certain things as far as my life is concerned. I mask those things that are shameful to me. I know those things, but you don't because I don't wish to share those things. But the problem is, is what you don't share, what's kept secret, can consume you. You're not safe if you don't share it, especially when it comes to stuff that can consume you. James, the brother of Jesus, said it this way, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We confess to God for forgiveness. We confess to one another for healing. Healing based upon the idea of accountability, also based upon the idea that people pray for you. People who genuinely care about you will pray for you. I belong to a CCG, a conference community group. It's a bunch of pastors and, and people who, guys who have been pastors in the past, and they, we get together and we talk about what's going on in our lives, personal lives, professional lives. We also talk about what's going on as far as our hearts are concerned, how our lives are either putting us to this place where we can, we can just praise God for the goodness of what he gives to us and also the pains as far as we have. It's also the temptations that we have. We often ask one another, what's going on in your life? How goes it with you? with your soul, as John Wesley would say. Those are the things we need to have a venue for in order for us to be able to be safe because what you keep secret, you place yourself in an unsafe place. Second. The third aspect is the blind spot. We all have blind spots in our life. It's the place that's exactly the opposite of the mask. The blind spot is the place where Everybody sees it because it's readily apparent, but you don't see it because you're too close to it. You know, it's so easy to see something going on with somebody else, but you can't see it with yourself. I remember back in the day when I was selling trees, I had this guy that I, <clears throat> I was trying to sell trees to. He was uh, a hedge fund manager in New York City highfalutin guy, high flyer. He was looking to uh, get a nursery going just so he could have a tax shelter for all the money he was making. So he bought uh, 
several hundred acres down in south of uh, Richmond, Virginia, and uh, he was looking to set up a nursery. So <clears throat> I was talking to him about trees, that he could sell to him, and uh, he could grow on and sell to other people. So he invited me for lunch. He had this big old plantation house, beautiful place. We had steak sandwiches on the front porch of his, of his house. And I'm eating the steak sandwich and this hunk of meat comes off and whack right in the belly. I didn't see it. I'm sure he saw it. So we're, we're talking back and forth. We finish up lunch, finish up uh, the meeting and so on and so forth. I go back to the, the truck. I'm headed out the, the driveway. And I look down and oh, you are such a pig. <laughs> I cannot be a, believe how big a pig I am. Just big old hunk and stain on my shirt. Suffice it to say, he didn't order anything from me. <laughs> I don't get trees from pigs. Um, the deal is, is that you need to have somebody in your life who can be honest with you. A profoundly truthful proverb. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy multiplies kisses. You have to have a friend who's willing to be honest with you. You say, you know what, dude? You look like a pig right now. Because you got a big old hunk and stain on your the front. Because people who don't care about you, they don't care whether you look like a pig or not. People who care about you say, dude, clean it up, will you please? Get a napkin. Although it's painful initially, it's the best thing for you and eventually. You need to have a place where people can be honest with you. That's the third reason. The fourth reason and the last reason involves potential. You know, we all have potential, but we all don't know exactly what our potential is, the, 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 the max out potential. It's a, a classic, I don't know, you don't know, because you really don't know what your potential is. I mean, you could be doing better than what you did before, but you still might not have made your potential, your ultimate potential, your full potential. So... <clears throat> How, got to get caught up here. Um, so why do you need people to help you out with this particular aspect? Because the right people will challenge you to grow. The right people will challenge you to grow. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, the proverb, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, is all about this idea of having something that is of greater density than what you are. That sharpens. You know, this is a, this is a knife sharpener. I picked it up at Walmart yesterday. You got to love a place where you can get a knife sharpener and nachos in the same, same place. It's absolutely awesome. Yeah, man. This knife sharpener is really simple. These things are really awesome. Because all you do is you just rake it across this really high carbon steel, and that sharpens the blade that you've got. It's the friction that sharpens the blade. So it is with people. We sharpen one another by the friction that we have, by coming into contact with one another. Now, in our culture, the idea of, of growing you really looks like some achievement. It makes you go further as far as your, your ability to achieve something. I swim at the Y. I do that for exercise. Usually, if I don't know anybody in the pool or I'm just by myself, I'm just going... Swim, 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 you know, back and forth, back and forth, nice and, nice and slow. But there's this guy, his name is Mike. Mike swims about the same speed that I do, I do when I'm swimming a lot faster than my normal slow speed. He challenges me to, to swim faster. 
I've swam the fastest I have ever swam when Mike was right next to me because there's a competition going, son of a gun, he's not, <laughs> not stopping to breathe. You get the point. But who cares how fast they swim? Does anybody care how fast they swim? I don't even care how, well, I do care how fast I swim. I'd rather swim slow than fast, but my, competi my competi competitive spirit gets in the way of that. Really, as a Christian, the idea of growing is all about growing in character and growing in Christ-likeness. Character and Christ-likeness. That's what that as iron sharpens iron. So we sharpen one another. That's what that's about. Character and Christ likeness. There's a guy, absolutely love Nels. He's a, a man that I, I have respected. We were in a <coughs> men's group together. And Nels proposed that we, right around this time of year, he said, why don't we do the biggest loser contest? We all throw a $20 bill in. All the guys in the, in the, in the, uh, the small group throw a $20 bill in, and whoever loses the most weight gets the money. Okay. Nels didn't do it with the motivation of getting the money. Because Nels was skinny and small. He had a different motive. There was another guy in the group. His name was Pat. Pat was big and he was wide. To the point where he was dangerously out of shape. Nels was concerned for Pat. He wanted to make sure that Pat lost weight with the hopes that he would get on a roll where he could become healthy once again. That was his motivation. That's the type of person you want to be encouraged and to emulate. That's the type of person that rubs off on you. The friction of that creates a higher character in you and more Christ-likeness in you. You don't know what your potential is. I don't know, you don't know. But what I do know is you will never get that to that potential alone. You need to have other people in you. And you will not get to that potential if you don't join a life group. If you just come on Sundays, I'm thankful, but you won't change straight up. And that, in essence, is our takeaway. Weekend worship is too large for everyone to know your name and your needs. Life groups are where you experience life change. Amen. As far as next steps, you'll find these next steps on the, your, uh, your program. It's part of your program. It's a connection card. I'll ask that everybody fill out the connection card. Um, if you would fill out your name and your contact information, I'd appreciate it because what we're trying to do is we're trying to update our files as far as contact information. So if everybody could do that, that would be much appreciated. If uh, there's people who need, uh, do we have extra programs we can hand out if people need it? If you raise your hands, maybe we've got some uh, extra programs we could, we could uh, send out to, or get out to people. Yeah. There's no pens? Yeah, could you? Yeah, why don't you get pens? Anybody who needs a pen, anybody who needs a, a program, uh, just raise your hand and uh, ushers will get them to you, okay? So <clears throat> the connection card is, is how we communicate for those of you who know what this story is. Um, you can fill out your name. If you're new, fill out the uh, uh, first time guest box. And uh, please help yourself to a, a gift at the hub if you're new with us, okay? Um, there's a place at the uh, bottom of the front of the connection card where you can fill in your prayer request. If you would appreciate a prayer team praying with you on a particular issue and subject, we, uh, we would love to do that. 
And on the back, you'll find um, these next steps. And also, you'll find I'm interested in. If you're interested in baptism, you can just check that box and we'll get back to you. If you're interested in something else, um, just mark that particular box and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you on that, okay? As far as these next steps are concerned, these are things that you can consider. I'm not saying that these are your next steps. I am saying they are next steps for you. And we're going to give you a, a minute, just a minute video, to consider next steps, okay? So at least these will prime the pump, and hopefully uh, something will take place with you where you can have your next steps. And then we'll pray it out after the... Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again because you are so good. You place us in relationships so that we might be able to encourage one another. You place us in relationships so you might be able to grow one another. We give you thanks because you gave us everything that we need, one another, so that we might be able to be a little bit more like you. I just pray for each and every one here that they might uh, really just have a tug on their heart to join a small group. And that they uh, might be able to, to be encouraged and held up and ultimately to be, uh, be the one that, uh, that looks like you. Just a little bit more than they did before. Help each of us to do that. Help us to sharpen one another up. Help us to be able to, to gain the potential or at least get closer to the potential you put into us. Won't you do that? I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. time I try to make it on my own. Every time I try to stand and start to fall. All those lonely days I have traveled on. There was Jesus. When the life I built came crashing to 
So I want to encourage you in the area of uh, giving tithes and offerings. And I always, I like to say, you know, why do we do that? It's easy to look at Scripture and find all the reasons in Scripture why we should, and those are all valid reasons. But I'm going to tell you right now, the reasons why we give is for the people who are not here yet. We give our time, we give our, our money, we give our efforts to, for people who are not yet here. And I was thinking, um, I, I've been involved in building campaigns in this, in this church for my whole life. And, and oftentimes when we have a campaign, I, they would ask me to sing a song because it was reflective of what we do now for the future. I just want to read you a, just a, a phrase from that, from that song, and it's, it's by Steve Green. It says, And may, who, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. We, we do things today for people who are not here. For the seats that are empty, that's why we give. That's why we, that's why we give our time and our money and our efforts for, for those empty seats. Because all of you are here because someone before you was faithful. That's why we give. So come and give in, in the name of the Lord for that reason.
pastor for a great message. You know, the pastor uh, mentioned something about the power of prayer. And uh, I'm just going to, you know, look, I'm not the preacher, but given the opportunity to sneak a preach, I might do it. <laughs> <laughs> so Marcus has given me this opportunity to, uh, I, I look around and I see people that I've prayed for and prayed with. You just go ahead and ask yourself. And I've seen even more people who have prayed for me. <laughs> and uh, you go, go ahead and ask yourself, did those miracles happen? Amen. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. So the power of prayer is incredible. Our God is, Randy spoke about it last night. Pastor Randy was talking about how it's just incredible, how indescribable in these lyrics in this next song. Indescribable. That's how big God is. And if you don't think that you have the power of prayer, oh, well, I, I can't heal people. You know, the disciples thought the same thing when Jesus sent them out to heal and pray for people. And it's not, it's, I've, I've heard other pastors say, not by will, not by might. What they're saying is, not by my will, not by my power, but by the will of God and by the power of God working through us. That is how these miracles happen. That is the power of prayer. And I encourage you to, uh, to, to also, side note, to volunteer. You know, our church needs volunteers. And in this song, you're going to get an opportunity to volunteer your voice up. And when you hear those other voices singing, that's what it sounds like. That, that feeling that you're going to get hearing all these other voices volunteering their voices up. That's what it feels like. When you have other volunteers running this whole machine called, we call a church, it takes a lot of people to do that. So when we when we have this opportunity later in the song to, to do that, I want you to really listen to that and pay attention to the way that makes you feel when you hear all of these voices come together. So with that, we're just going to go right into this.
put the stars in the sky and you know them by name. I've heard Pastor John say, a billion trillion stars, a billion trillion names, yet he knows your name. And how important is that? The scripture says, who am I that you are mindful of me? You have all this stuff, yet you still know who I am. And a church is a place where you can know one another better. I've been teaching it, we taught for a long time, and over the years, Brenda can probably attest, I have students come up to me, they're 30, 40 years ago, they say, Mr. Phillips, you probably don't remember me, do you? And fortunately, there's something in their face, there's an iris smile, so yeah, Danny. And you can see the smile on their face because they know that you remembered them. This is a place where people will know and remember you. This is a place you should be, be in better connection with God. Give that some thought. God bless you. We'll see you next time.